What's up, everyone? Welcome to Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Bron Bathelstone. So today we're having another episode of my character build series. Today presenting to you the double bladed genie lock. So this is the second part of my four part series where I'll be doing no dip builds for all four of the different genie patrons. Last time out, we did the Afrit lock, which was a type of blaster. And this time we're doing the genie lock, which is a whirling dervish. So I'm really happy with this build. It is oozing style and it crushes it mechanically and it does so in a refreshing Johnny type of way. So that's exactly the sort of build that I like to have on my channel and I really can't wait to show it to you. I want to thank the boys in my Patreon Discord. Once again, they always help out tremendously. In particular, Max Koto, who came up with the concept that we decided to roll with and it really works. So uh, well done. And if you want to be a part of that, feel free to check out the Patreon or like, subscribe, comment, and share if you want to support the channel. Without further ado, let's take a look at the double bladed genie lock. So I've put the setup on the screen so you can check it out. You can see that the double bladed genie lock is going to be a wood elf with strength eight, dex 17, con 14, intelligence eight, wisdom 12, and charisma 15. Because we're wood elves, we get a stack of abilities. Dark Vision 60 feet, Fey Ancestry, Trance, Keen Senses, Elf Weapons, 35 foot move, and Mask of the Wild. As always, I'll be comparing our build DPR to a standard DPR baseline of Agonizing Blast plus Hex hitting 60% of the time, and an elite DPR baseline of a Fighter with Fighting Style Archery, Crossbow Expert, and Sharpshooter hitting 70% of the time. Note that I present the build DPR in modular form so that you know what you're doing from round to round based on the choices that you make. And if you want to know what you're doing over the course of what you consider to be an average battle, you're going to have to do a little bit more math, but I've at least provided you the figures that you can do that. I'm also going to be coloring the DPR boxes so that we can have a quick sense of how we're doing. But to do so, I need to start making assumptions. So see my big block of qualifying text, reference the three videos in the description, and take everything with a grain of salt. But generally speaking, I'll be coloring the boxes red if they fall below the standard DPR baseline, yellow if they are between the standard and the elite DPR baselines, green if they are above the elite DPR baseline, and white if they are way above it, by which I mean 120% of it or better. My assumed value in the DPR box will be underlined for clarity. So one of the great things about this Genie Lock build is that it has elite playability it's amazing right out of the gate at level one, and it's fully online by level seven. So while I go straight here, it offers a lot of fertile ground for multi-classing if you want to go in a different direction once you get to seven or 11 or some other level that you find appealing and then stack on a few levels of something else, feel free. But it doesn't need it because this genie lock is lethal and awesome and cool, even without dipping, as we'll see. Our playstyle will be as a melee skirmisher, so we're not going to be the ranged blasty type of warlock, except maybe at level one. You might want to play as a ranged attacker at level one. We don't have to, but it might make more sense. We'll talk about that in a minute. Also note that we're not actually that great at skirmishing until level three. We're more of a straight frontline build until then, but fortunately 5e is designed for a pretty quick ride to level three. Now we needed to go with an elf here because of feet prerequisites, and I decided on wood elf so that we had lore consistency, move 35, which I'm a huge fan of, and Mask of the Wild, which is sneaky awesome. And the reason for the lore consistency is that we are putting the double-bladed scimitar on the map, baby. My understanding is that there's not too many good double-bladed scimitar builds out there, so I'm happy to throw a killer your way if you're into the double-bladed scimitar. Note to pick up stealth proficiency and character creation to leverage Mask of the Wild. We're also gonna be able to turn invisible and stuff, so it's gonna come in handy. But that said, feel free to choose a different elf. We didn't necessarily have to go with Wood Elf here if your DM is cool with you taking the Double Bladed Scimitar on any elf. So Eladrin and Shatter Kai and the Mark of the Shadow elf options I think can be pretty good as well. You can just use your custom origin to switch your weapons to the Scimitar and the Double Bladed Scimitar and then you can have the same flavor. And I'd also like to point out that this build concept isn't necessarily restricted to the Genie. The genie mechanics aren't exactly critical to this build, so you could technically pull it off with one of the other genie patrons. But that said, I think this one is the most appropriate for this particular approach, because the other genies have spell lists that I think offer better synergies with different approaches. 
The Dow encourages a buffed Eldritch Blast ranged attack plus spike growth slash wall of stone approach. The Efreet Lock encourages blasting, as we saw in my previous build, Blast Brawn Efreet Lock. And the Merit encourages control and leveraging heavy obscurement with Fog Cloud and Sleet Storm. So it seems to me that the playstyle that we actually take on here is only viable for the Genie, and it's just dripping with role-playing synergy. Because there's a lot of in real life flavor with the genie being from the same lore as the scimitar. And remember, this is a double bladed scimitar build. All right, a flying scimitar skirmisher is a whirling dervish to me. And that just screams genie, in my opinion. So at level one, we start with genie's vessel for bottled respite and genie's wrath. We get two cantrips, two spells known, and one first level pack slot. Remember, we are not dipping on this build and are going all the way to 20 as Genie Warlocks. Our cantrips will be Minor Illusion and Toll the Dead. Minor Illusion for tricksiness and defense. I consider this to be the best cantrip in 5e, so an easy add for me. That said, our main attack is going to be the Longbow, as I'll discuss in a minute, and you can't shoot through a Minor Illusion with a Longbow without revealing it. So we would have to pretend that it's real cover and move in and out from behind it to preserve the illusion, which wouldn't get us attacks at advantage even though they probably wouldn't attack us, but that's probably not ideal. We also added Toll the Dead as a decent ranged attack with no visible origin, and that's going to combo a lot nicer with Minor Illusion just at level 1. You might not want to even do this, I'm just saying this is a pretty safe way to attack at level 1 if you need to. It's definitely not the playstyle that we're going with at level 2. To our spells known, we add Hex and Expeditious Retreat, Hex as a bonus action offensive option, it adds necrotic damage, which is pretty solid. Only about 5% of creatures are resistant and about 3.4% of creatures are immune. And we added Expeditious Retreat for defense against and to enable kiting. Expeditious Retreat has nice synergy with move 35. If you start adjacent to an enemy and then dash to get 70 feet away, he cannot get next to you even if he dashes, and then you're gonna have the range to operate and control the range, etc. So move 35 is pretty awesome when you have that bonus action dash from Expeditious Retreat. And in fact, it's also nice because having a move 35 means that you're not gonna to have to cast Expeditious Retreat as often. And remember, we have one pack slot right now. Now, obviously Expeditious Retreat is better in an unconstrained environment, but regardless, it's part of the standard caster defensive suite that I add to every single build when possible. Big no-brainer for me to get Expeditious Retreat here. So our Genie's Vessel is online. It comes in different forms, so decide which form you like the best, and then take the ring. We pretty much have to take the ring on this build because we're going to need both hands available. You'll see why here shortly. But note also this build doesn't get a familiar. So you're going to have to arrange with an ally who can carry it for you when you go into it. Note the Vessel is not particularly durable, only has an AC equal to your spell save DC and hit points equal to your proficiency bonus plus level. Even though it is immune to poison and psychic, it's pretty easy to break. But if it does break, it's only an hour to replace, and you can stack this with a short or long rest. Note that we do need to be touching the vessel in order to use either of its two abilities, and both of these abilities are pretty sweet. Bottled Respite is a fantastic defensive option. It's like an always available rope trick plus bag of holding. It's nice for being able to store stuff easily, and do note that some of this stuff can have glyphs of warding on it. This can get cheesy, if you can start leveraging glyphs of warding through your allies, through tattoos, through various game mechanics, and that could get cheesy, so talk it out with your DM, you don't want to break his game, but I just wanted to call this to your attention. You can do that. And note when we're in the bottled respite, we can only hear the surroundings of the vessel and we can't see them. It might sometimes be problematic if you can't see outside of it. It's also a little annoying that you can only enter it once per long rest, but we can manage that. We also get Genie's Wrath, which is going to provide an always welcome DPR bump. And getting Thunder damage is fantastic. Only 2.2% of creatures are resistant, and only 0.8% of creatures are immune to Thunder, so 97% of the time you're good to go. For our weapons, we are going with the Scimitar and the Longbow, and we're going to be using two Scimitars with two weapon fighting. This has nice synergy with Hex, which applies its bonus per attack. And as you can see in the DPR box, it's going to generate some pretty impressive numbers, but in my opinion, I think we should try to stick with the longbow until level 2, because we're a bit squishy at the moment with only a 15 AC, and we don't have a lot of hit points. So at level 1, a bad damage roll can really, really be bad. I would probably try and stay at ranged at level 1, and I'm a huge fan of the longbow because it has that epic 150-600 foot range. 
but you could go with the heavy crossbow, which has plus one damage relative to the longbow, you know, if you prefer and if you can get one. But I do prefer the longbow for the range and for the fact that we're just going to have to switch to it later anyway, so why not go with it from level one? Our armor will be studded leather plus dex for an unimpressive 15. So to survive level one, we're going to be leveraging the environment, minor illusion, and expeditious retreat to stay safe. Our starting DPR box is white at 133% of the elite DPR baseline if we use the scimitars. If we're using the longbow, it's only a yellow DPR box at about 86% of the elite DPR baseline. And that's assuming that we have hex up, just like the standard DPR baseline. Our rounds one and two are pretty simple. We're either going to attack or minor illusion plus bonus action hex on round one. And then we're going to be either attacking or casting Toll the Dead plus our bonus action attack if we attacked in round two. At level two, our invocations come online and we switch up our fighting style a bit. We're no longer going to be using minor illusion as a combat option and it's primarily for utility now. To our preps, we add protection from evil slash good as an excellent defensive option versus the specified creatures, not to mention their charm, fear, and possession abilities. And for our invocations, we are going with Fiendish Vigor and Devil Sight. Fiendish Vigor is going to give us a really nice durability bump for level 2. Adding 8 temporary hit points makes a big difference when you only have 17. This is going to give us the option to transition to melee, which is what I recommend. Even though we have the unimpressive AC, having that little force field of temporary hit points is going to give us some extra durability. And I feel comfortable with the extra hit points of being at level 2 plus Fiendish Vigor to now enter melee and start doing that really impressive two-weapon fighting damage. That said, don't hesitate to fall back on level 1 ranged tactics or hiding in the minor illusion casting Toll the Dead if we're getting hurt. It's still an option that we can pull out if we need it. And Fiendish Vigor is a one-level thing. We're dropping it at the next level. Devil's Sight we also add for the next level. It really doesn't do much for us yet, but we need to take it now because we can only swap out one invocation and I'm going to be swapping out Fiendish Vigor next level. One little benefit from this is that it does extend our vision in the dark to 120 feet, so it does create that little buffer zone where you can get perfect obscurement versus dark vision of 60 feet. No change to our DPR situation, but we're going to clean up our round 1 and 2 a little bit and go straight with attack plus bonus action hex, and in round 2, attack plus bonus action attack. At level 3, to our spells known, we add Misty Step and Darkness, dropping protection from evil slash good. Misty Step, of course, is an elite maneuverability option, always very happy to add it. And we add Darkness to enable the Devil Sight plus Darkness combo to enable our preferred playstyle of skirmishing. I want to mention straight away that while this is our first option for levels 3 through 6, we are going to be retaining Hex as a backup because we don't actually lose much by going with Hex and so we are not going to be casting Darkness if it gets in the way of the party. We will go with Hex instead because party performance is of the highest consideration. I want to make that clear. But that said, Darkness plus Devil Sight is a good combo for us for the next four levels. We'll be casting it on our boots so that it moves with us. And note that it does take an action to cast. So we're going to want to pre-buff this aggressively, and it's helpful that it has a 10 minute duration when it comes to that. And you can also stick with Hex for its bonus action cast if you want to try and kill something more quickly. Because you can get three attacks out on the first two rounds if you go with Hex, versus just two if you go with Darkness. So that's still an option. But in any case, the Darkness plus Devil Sight is going to create perfect obscurement versus creatures lacking Blind Sight, True Sight, Devil Sight, or Tremor Sense. And that's going to eliminate opportunity attacks, allowing us to be skirmishers. We're immune to sight spells, we're attacked at disadvantage, which is going to give us a really nice AC bump, and we get our attacks at advantage to maintain strong DPR output without Hex. Now, personally, I think that the 15-foot radius or 6 by 6 square area of darkness is manageable because it's going to be moving with us and we are going to be skirmishing, so ideally we should be able to end our move at a point where the darkness isn't interfering with allies. And again, if it does interfere with allies, we can just use Hex. It's not a big deal. But we at least have both options, and of those two options, Darkness plus Devil Sight is the superior option for us. Now we are going to go with Pact of the Blade here to give us a Pact weapon that we can make out of Wind, which I think is really sweet. Note that it does take an action to make, 
even though it lasts indefinitely, so don't be switching weapons lightly, although it is nice that you can switch them, especially because we're adding improved packed weapon, dropping fiendish vigor. Having a magic weapon plus one is fantastic, especially since the odds of finding a magic double-bladed scimitar are lower than Witchbolt being the right cast. It's not happening, folks, so being able to create one on your own is super good. And we can switch it to a longbow if we want to retain a strong ranged DPR option. So that's really nice. Improved packed weapon is really a nice add for us here. And do note that you can use it as a spellcasting focus, and that will help us at level 3 when we are using two scimitars, and we're going to want to be able to cast a spell. At next level, it stops really mattering. Our DPR box stays white, but bumps to 145% of the elite DPR baseline with Hex, and also stays white at 128% of the elite DPR baseline if we go with Darkness plus Devil Sight. So Hex does generate more damage, but it doesn't give us the defenses that Darkness and Devil Sight gives us. And we got that bump because of the improved pack weapon. So we have regular and aggressive options for our rounds 1 and 2. Our regular round 1 will be Darkness, and our regular round 2 will be Attack plus Bonus Action Attack. And if we're being aggressive in round one, we're going to attack and bonus action hex, and then followed up with two attacks in round two. At level four, we add Mind Sliver to our cantrips to set up our own or ally Saber Sucks with its elite debuff rider. It also has nice synergy with Minor Illusion, as it has no visible origin and won't reveal the illusion if we have to fall back on that tactic, which hopefully we won't at this point. To our spells known, we're adding Invisibility for utility and for role-playing synergy, I'll be reskinning this as Body of Wind, and it's always nice to be able to turn invisible. Again, make sure you invest in stealth at character creation. But more importantly, our ASI is going to Revenant Blade to enable the Double Bladed Scimitar. This is a big bump for us, although check with your DM. Technically, the Double Bladed Scimitar is Eberron specific, so he might say no to that. Obviously, if that's the case, this isn't the build for you. So Revenant Blade is a half feat, so we're going to bump our decks to 18. We get a plus one AC bump on top of that, which is fantastic. So now our AC is 18, which is decent, especially since we're being attacked at disadvantage in most cases because of darkness. And the Double Bladed Scimitar works great for us. It's now a finesse weapon, so our high dex works with it. We can use it even if we didn't take proficiency in it because it's our packed weapon. It greatly improves our bonus action attack because now we can add our dex bonus to it and improve pack weapon applies to it. So really nice add for us here. Our DPR box stays white at 135% of the elite DPR baseline with hex, and it's right there at 133% of the elite DPR baseline if we go with darkness plus devil sight. We switched weapons and bumped our dex, and the elite baseline got a big bump as sharpshooter came online. No change to our round one and two. Then at level five, to our spells known, we add Spirit Shroud and Wind Wall, dropping Hex. Spirit Shroud is an excellent combat option that is now going to replace Hex as our backup to Darkness. I'm going to reskin this as Shroud of the Sandstorm, and it's a pretty nice DPR bump relative to Hex, while remaining a bonus action to cast, which is nice. Plus it adds the option of choosing Necrotic, Radiant, or Cold Damage, and that's a sneaky nice little bump relative to Hex, which was Necrotic only, and this is going to allow us to most likely avoid resistances and immunities on that extra damage. And the Healing Prevention Rider can be situationally useful. Maybe you're fighting something with regeneration or that can cast healing spells. The Move Reduction Rider isn't as great because it only applies to enemies that we can see within 10 feet, and we're mostly going to be avoiding that sort of situation. We add Wind Wall as a situational defensive option versus ranged attackers. If we set it up right, we can personally move or at the next level fly through the wall and then make our attacks normally, then go right back behind the wall and they can't attack us through it. And that's going to increase the percentage of auto wins that are generated by having a fly speed. So that doesn't come on until next level, but something to keep in mind. See my deep dive series video on wall spells for more info about wind wall. To our invocations, we add Thirsting Blade. Getting an extra attack is kind of a no-brainer for a weapons build. And that really nicely bumps our DPR so that we stay white at 152% of the Elite DPR baseline. And we're still white at 139% of the Elite DPR baseline when we go with Darkness plus Devil Sight. We added an extra attack through Thirsting Blade, and we improved Hex to Spirit Shroud, while the Elite DPR baseline just added extra attack. A slight change to our round 1 and 2 as Spirit Shroud replaces Hex. 
At level 6, to our spells known, we add Dispel Magic and Counterspell, dropping Expeditious Retreat. Dispel Magic is a self-explanatory caster must have, and Counterspell is a decent reaction versus casters. More importantly, Elemental Gift is online for a concentration-free fly speed as a bonus action. This is an epic add for us that gives us a huge power bump because we can now skirmish while flying. Let that sink in for a minute. It's so good we are now flying skirmishers. I mean, a fly speed is already amazing in a vacuum because it'll generate you auto wins in 60 to 70% of cases in 5th edition. And ours only needs a bonus action to proc. And then hover is fantastic to remove the potential of falling if we're made prone or unable to move, especially since we don't have access to feather fall. Although that said, even so, be sensible and don't fly any higher than you need to. That never makes sense. But this is so good. The combo of a bonus action to use, no concentration, and hover makes this an elite version of a fly speed. This is the sort of fly speed that you often don't see until late tier 3, like the Sorcerer Wings or Fine Greater Steed. So really impressive to be bringing it online at level 6. It's nice to combo with Teleports into the Air, currently Misty Step and later Dimension Door. And it does have a 10 minute duration, so that's pretty nice. It might last multiple battles, so pre-buff aggressively, because ideally you'd like to have Spirit Shroud and Elemental Gift online when initiative is rolled. We also get Thunder Resistance from Elemental Gift, but this is seriously lame. There are no creatures in the game that exclusively do Thunder damage, and there's only a handful of spells. I mean, I honestly think that the only time this might be useful is if an ally thundersteps in your vicinity, and then you can avoid some of the damage, but really not a good resistance here. In any case, Elemental Gift is epic, but be aware it's only proficiency times per long rest, so manage your uses and don't deploy it if you don't need to and you're going to get a lot of mileage out of this. Our DPR box stays white at 127% of the Elite DPR baseline with Spirit Shroud, but it would drop to green at 117% of the Elite DPR baseline if we're sticking with Darkness plus Devil Sight. Still pretty good though. The Elite DPR baseline got a little dex bump that got them a little bit closer to us. All we got was the fly speed. Slight change to our round 1 and 2. In our normal approach, our round 1 will be Darkness plus Bonus Action Elemental Gift followed by round two, attack plus bonus action attack. Or if we're being aggressive, we can on round one attack and activate Spirit Shroud with our bonus action. And then in round two, we can attack and bonus action attack and pop the elemental gift when we have a chance. Level seven is a huge level for us as the build essentially fully comes online. To our spells known, we add Dimension Door and Shadow of Moil, dropping Misty Step. Dimension Door is an upgrade to Misty Step, so no need to keep it. And remember, it has synergy with our fly speed because we can be teleporting into the air, no problem. But more importantly, Shadow of Moil is online, a fantastic combat option, which we are going to reskin as Aura of the Whirlwind. Shadow of Moil is going to be our primary concentration option for the rest of our career. Now note that it is an action cast versus Hex and Spirit Shroud being bonus action casts but this does clean up our round one bonus action a little bit by reserving it for elemental gift, and it's still worth it in terms of action economy to cast it in round one. Although, of course, we do want to pre-buff this whenever possible. So like Darkness plus Devil Sight, Shadow of Moil creates perfect obscurement versus creatures lacking Blind Sight or True Sight, but it's not going to interfere with the party ever. No opportunity attacks, no sight spells, attack at disadvantage, attacks at advantage, all of those things are super fantastic. And then it stacks on Radiant Resistance, which is situationally useful, even though Radiant is a very uncommon damage type. It's the second least likely, mostly Celestials and Clerics. But some spells do do Radiant, so it might come up. But in any case, it gets the Radiant Resistance and it gets Retaliation Damage, which is fantastic for our melee playstyle, because of course we're going to take hits, and when they do, our enemies are going to be punished to the tune of 9 damage. Now that said, don't get fancy and start letting yourself get hit to proc the retaliation damage. You're only going to end up losing your concentration, and we certainly don't want that. Now even though Shadow of Moil is our plan A, we are going to be retaining Spirit Shroud as a backup option for special occasions. Remember it is a bonus action cast, and that can be helpful if we really need to kill something in round one. We can squeeze in an extra attack. And it will do more damage than Shadow of Moil. 
that can't be overlooked because it's a pretty considerable bump. It's at least DPR plus 10 or so if you're just talking about normal attacks starting at level 9. It's currently only like plus 2, but at level 9 it gets to like plus 10. And by level 12, it can be like DPR plus 25 per round if you can somehow get attacks at advantage without using your concentration. For example, versus a prone target or something. And that just happens to be a condition that we're going to be able to create next level with Eldritch Smite. So sometimes when we really need to light something up, Spirit Shroud is something that is going to allow us to do that. And it will be useful against those creatures that do have Blind Sight or True Sight. Because remember, that's going to defeat our Shadow of Moil, so we need to have a backup for those. And again, it will be useful versus creatures with regeneration or healing abilities. And it will also be useful versus creatures with necrotic, radiant, or cold vulnerability. Because we can switch to that and then double up our damage. For our invocations, we're going to be adding Eldritch Mind and Armor of Shadows, dropping Devil Sight, which we don't need anymore. Eldritch Mind is a great add for us because that's really going to help us out with the concentration saves. We're pretty rarely going to be losing our concentration now despite the fact that we're a melee playstyle. We have a fly speed, we're immune to opportunity attacks, we have a good AC, we're attacked at disadvantage, we're immune to sight spells, and we roll our concentration saves at advantage with Eldritch Mind. We're going to be pretty solid on the concentration thing. And we're adding Armor of Shadows to give us an AC bump of plus one. Not that impressive, and at this level we might very well have acquired Studded Leather plus one at this point, which means that we're not going to need Armor of Shadows, or maybe we can even convince an ally to devote a Mage Armor slot to us every day, in which case we also don't need Armor of Shadows. So if you don't need it here, I would definitely add Tomb of Levistus to give us a really nice situational defensive reaction. We're really kind of lacking in the reaction department, and Tomb of Levistus is a really nice one. So definitely add that here if we don't need Armor of Shadows. Now our DPR box dips to green at 117% of the Elite DPR baseline when we're using Shadow of Moil. But that said, don't forget that Shadow of Moil does have retaliation damage, which I'm not accounting for in the color of the DPR box. And note that the retaliation damage does actually scale pretty nicely because in 5th edition, the higher creatures get in CR, the more damage they do, but they usually do that damage through adding multi-attacks. They don't usually add just like bigger hits. You know, with exceptions, of course, like the T-Rex. But generally, that's how it works in 5th edition, and so sparking that retaliation damage on every attack is going to scale, even when you get into higher levels. Shadow of Moil, man, it's really, really good. And that said, you can get about a 10% DPR bump if you go with Spirit Shroud instead of Shadow of Moil. Always an option to go full offense. Our rounds 1 and 2 switch up a little bit. Normally, we'll be going with Shadow of Moil plus bonus action elemental gift in round 1, followed by attack plus bonus action attack in round 2. Or when we're going aggressive, we can attack plus bonus action Spirit Shroud in round 1, followed by attack plus bonus action attack. At level 8, to our spells known, we add Fly and Banishment, dropping Darkness. Fly, of course, is an elite maneuverability option. We are going to reskin this as a Wind Carpet. And this is intended to, one, back up Elemental Gift, just in case we ever run out of uses, we can still fly. But two, it's also a fantastic option for casting on allies so that they can fly. Especially since when we use a 4th or 5th level pack slot, we can affect 2 or 3 targets. So that's really elite in a lot of situations. And it has sweet role-playing synergy, because we're genie locks, so I'm really happy to add Fly here. And we're adding Banishment as a nice situational saver suck option. Remember that we can set it up with Mind Sliver, and it's nice to upcast because we get two targets per 5th level pack slot, once we get them at the next level. We get another ASI, which we'll devote to Dex plus 2 to max out our combat stat, and get an AC bump. And our DPR box bumps back up to white at 122% of the Elite DPR baseline even though we both got stat bumps. No change to our round 1 and 2. Then at level 9, to our spells known, we add Scrying. Now honestly, you can choose something else. The choice of our packed slot spells known is really not that important going forward because we've got all of our main tactics in place already. So at this point, we are literally adding nothing but utility, situational options, and role-playing options. So if you don't like Scrying, take something else, but I think Scrying is pretty fantastic for utility, gives us a nice little Terms of Engagement bump, especially when you are getting it back on a short rest, because that means you can basically spam it. That makes it really great. 
to our invocations, we are adding Eldritch Smite. And that's going to give us a nice Nova option. And note that it does work with the Longbow, which will open up the option for us to prone enemies from range to help out allies and stuff if it's tactically advantageous. And that's pretty sweet. I like having tactical options so that we're pretty flexible in combat and can offer different looks and respond to different threats. Now note that we only have two pack slots right now. So resources for an Eldritch Smite might be scarce, but it does become more viable at levels 11 and 17 as we get more pack slots. In any case, because we only have two slots right now, we are only using this when we get a critical and it's an important hit or when the prone is like super advantageous. But it's probably better to use it on a critical, and we do get a critical 14% of the time, once we add Elven Accuracy at 12. And the Eldritch Smite does have decent synergy with the Spirit Shroud option, if you're really selling out for offense and maxing out your DPR, because you do prone them with Eldritch Smite. And then that will generate attacks at advantage that you can use to buff your Spirit Shroud damage, and you didn't need Shadow of Moil to do it. So it's a pretty significant boost. Again, not that impressive at this level, but it's going to be like plus 25 per round once you get to level 12. That's not anything to sneeze at. In any case, Eldritch Smite is really nice for this build, and I'm very happy to add it. Note also that our duration on Bottled Respite bumps to 8 hours, so we can take a long rest in there now. Our DPR box is still at white at 125% of the Elite DPR baseline because our Genie's Wrath bumped up to plus 4 and we got a little boost there. And no change to our round 1 and 2. At level 10, we get a new cantrip, so we're adding Mage Hand for range utility. But more importantly, our Sanctuary Vessel is online. Now note again that we don't have a familiar. So we're going to have to arrange with somebody to carry the vessel or guard the vessel when we bring the party inside. So hopefully one of our allies does have a familiar or a homunculus or a pet that can handle that sort of thing. Or you can choose an ally who can do that, ideally someone who's really sneaky or maneuverable. And do note that we can help out with this because we can cast fly or invisibility on whoever carries the vessel and that's going to be pretty good defenses, especially if we're talking about just a short rest. Also, if we're not looking to move around and we just want to rest, we don't necessarily need anyone to carry or guard us because what we can do is we can bury the vessel in the dirt with our fingers still touching it or sticking it in some other sneaky location like a crack or under some garbage or something. And then you can pull everyone into it and it's going to be very unlikely for anyone to find you and disturb you, especially if you're doing only the 10 minute thing. But even a one hour or an eight hour rest, if you set it up right, it can be pretty safe. Note that with the Sanctuary Vessel that we can designate one ally to extract everybody else from danger. If I pop everyone into the vessel is kind of a last line of ultimate defense approach. And that's always nice to have in our back pocket. The party can long rest in there as a pseudo tiny hut. We can easily overland travel inside of the vessel. Again, we're going to need some help from our allies here. And the vessel can go underwater or be teleported if you have the means with no issue to the people inside. And getting a short rest per day in only 10 minutes is sneaky awesome. This is basically a free catnap per day, which is a third level spell. And that's fantastic for us because we're one of the classes that can take advantage of that because we get our pack slots back on a short rest. So that's always fantastic for a warlock, especially because it makes Eldritch Smite a tad more viable. We might be willing to blow both of our spell slots in one battle if we know that we can get them back on a 10 minute short rest through the Sanctuary Vessel. So because we can bring the party in there, it has synergy with short rest parties that have lots of PCs that have abilities that regenerate on a short rest, presuming that your party is no more than six people, including yourself. And the fact that we get a little proficiency bonus bump to our healing on a short rest never hurts. Note also that we can potentially drag enemies inside of it. They do have to be willing, but we can influence creatures in this game through charm or command or some such. And if we can get them inside the vessel, they're screwed. They can't break out. They can't get out until we let them out. And while we do need to be in there with them, I think this is still a pretty sneaky awesome ability that may come in handy one day. So definitely keep it in mind. No change to our DPR situation. No change to our round one and two. At level 11, to our spells known, we add Seeming for a solid, no concentration, eight hour duration utility spell. It's also on the genie list, so nice role playing synergy. And also note that it's an eight hour duration, so we can restrict this and get the slot back. 
see my deep dive series video on rest tricking for more information. More importantly, our Mystic Arcanum is online to add true seeing. Such a great utility spell, true seeing. I always like to pay attention to the terms of engagement, so adding true seeing here is just fantastic. And I think it's kind of nice that the two abilities that we pick up are the different sides of the same mechanic. With seeming, we're covering our entire party with a disguised self, and with true seeing, we're seeing through such things. Also, since we hit 11th level, we got a third packed slot, which is super fantastic just across the board, but especially in regards to Eldritch Smite, because with three slots, it's a lot more viable to pop one of those. So this is a really nice level for us in that regard. We are definitely getting our Smite on. Our DPR box does drop to yellow here. It's only 94% of the Elite DPR baseline right now. Because the Elite DPR baseline got a big bump with extra attack times two, and ours didn't change. However, it's just a one level anomaly. We're going to be getting right back on track with a bullet next level, so no need to worry. And remember, if we absolutely positively want to have a white DPR box where we are doing over 120% of the Elite baseline, we can always go with Spirit Shroud. It still generates those white box numbers. We're just going with Shadow of Moil because I love my defenses. No change to our round one and two. Then at level 12, we add Life Drinker to our invocations to give us a huge DPR bump. It does add necrotic damage, so again, 5% of creatures resistant and 3.4% immune. But that's going to bump our damage to plus 9 with each swing. That is really fantastic. We're also getting a bump from adding Elven Accuracy here, with which we will be bumping our Charisma to 16, right on time to increase the impact of Life Drinker. This is really elegant timing because Charisma 16 would have done nothing for us before now, so adding it right when we need it, oh so good. And of course Elven Accuracy is going to have nice synergy with Shadow of Moil because Shadow of Moil is constantly granting us attacks at advantage, and that's going to proc Elven Accuracy. Really nice add for us here. It bumps our DPR box back up to white at 128% of the Elite DPR baseline, no change to our round one and two. At level 13, we add Teleport Circle for utility. Again, add something else if Teleport Circles aren't any good in your campaign. More importantly, our Mystic Arcanum 7 is online to add Force Cage, which we will reskin as Bands of the Zephyr. And I don't need to go on, right? This is one of the best spells in 5th edition, so super happy to add it and nice role-playing synergy in my opinion. Our DPR box stays white at 131% of the Elite DPR baseline because our Genie's Wrath bumped to plus 5. No change to our round 1 and 2. And then level 14 is an exciting level for us because Limited Wish is online to be amazeballs! Oh, so good. Absolutely amazing on the fly for the creative player where you can just pull any spell out that you need. Yes, it takes a D4 long rest to recover, but still, man, oh, so good to have in your back pocket. Some standout options. I think Catnap is pretty incredible with this build so that we can quickly get back those pack slots. We can throw down a Revivify or a Greater Restoration when we need to without having to pay the costly component, which is always nice. We can use Anti-Life Shell versus creatures that rely on natural weapons, which is significantly going to increase the percentage of auto wins generated by our fly speed and can just be amazing in so many scenarios. In a choke point, pushing creatures around, definitely talk to your DM about how exactly Anti-Life Shell is going to work at the table. Pass Without Trace is an interesting option that can have a massive impact in the right moment. We can add Transport via Plants and Word of Recall without having to prep them, and those are going to complement Teleportation Circle to give us some nice transportation options. We'll be able to summon any sort of creature that our allies wish to plane or bind, because remember, you need two players for that, one to summon and one to bind. Otherwise, the summon disappears six seconds before the planar binding sticks. And whereas we suck at planar binding because we can only go up to fifth level slots, and for planar binding, you really want to upcast it as high as possible, we're still going to be very helpful to our allies on the summoning side of things. And we'll be able to start using Walls of Stone, Bones of the Earth, Stone Shape, and Move Earth to build our castle. Oh, so cool. It's a lengthy project to be sure, but a man has to have hobbies and we do get downtime. So we're gonna start working on that and eventually it'll be done. And we are going to be super happy. Or we can use Disintegrate if we wanna do a bat cave or both. Why not both? In any case, really super cool. I'm gonna put a chart of strong possible options on the screen that you can consider for Limited Wish. 
Use your judgment, but man, so good to have limited wish available. No change to our DPR situation, no change to our round one and two. At level 15, to our spells known, we add Dream, which is really nice for utility and for non-combat assassinations, because while it's not a combat spell, it's pretty crazy what you can do with it to your enemies when you're not in combat. You can mess with them so hard, and you can impart exhaustion, which means you can basically kill anyone in a week. That is sneaky good. Plus, sending messages over long distances can be sneaky good, so I like Dream, but again, feel free to take something else. It literally doesn't matter. We get our Mystic Arcanum 8 online, and I went with Dominate Monster here. That can be pretty awesome to turn a powerful enemy into a powerful ally for a whole hour. And to our invocations, we are adding Visions of Distant Realms. Because man, Arcane Eye at will is so ridiculous. Just gathers so much intel. Check with your DM, maybe it breaks the game and he'll be willing to bribe you into not taking it. In any case, no change to our DPR, no change to our rounds one and two. At level 16, we get another ASI, which we devote to Defensive Duelist to give us a fantastic defensive reaction. It's always on, it's always available. It's really gonna help out even at only one time per round. And we've been really lacking in the reactions department, so it's nice to get a good solid one that we can use to bump our AC by plus five. That's really good. No change to our DPR, no change to our rounds one and two. At level 17, we enter tier four. To our spells known, we add creation for utility. And we get our Mystic Arcanum 9 online to add Wish. Duh. So good to add Wish. Oh my goodness. Way too much to go into here. But we're going to add a Simulacrum and a Contingency and a Greater Steed and a Homunculus and a Familiar. And just all that stuff that you can do with Wish, right? You guys know how good Wish is and we've got it. And don't forget, we've been lacking a homunculus or a familiar this whole time, so it's going to be nice to finally have one to work with the genie's vessel. Our DPR box stays white at 134% of the elite DPR baseline because our genie's wrath bumps up to plus 6, and no change to our round 1 and 2. At level 18, we add another invocation, and we are going with Witch Sight. To give us that awesome, always-on, pseudo-true-seeing. Because remember, I'm Bill Braun Bafflestone, and I love an always-on terms of engagement bump. It's going to clue us in when we need to cast True Seeing. It's going to have nice synergy with Arcane Eye. Super good one, Witch Sight. No change to our DPR. No change to our round one and two. At level 19, to our spells known, we add Tongues for utility. Obviously, I'm really grasping at straws here to add spells. Pick what you like. More importantly, Lucky is online for those sweet rerolls. One of the best feats in the game. I always try and add it. Always happy to add it even at level 19. No change to our DPR situation. No change to our round one and two. And finally, at level 20, we add Eldritch Master, our capstone. We get a daily refresh of pack slots, which is awesome sauce. In addition to our Sanctuary Vessel, we can now quickly refresh our pack slots twice a day. Yeah, baby, we're going to be getting our Smite on. Our DPR box does drop to green at 107% of the Elite DPR baseline because they added extra attack times three. Still not enough to quite catch up to us. So we are still looking good. No change to our round one and two. So that's it. That's the double bladed genie lock. Man, I love this build. It is really elegant. It's super lethal, super playable with white box DPR from level one and fully online by level seven. Man, it's just oozing with flavor, oozing with style. I'm really happy with this. But let me know what you think in the comments below. And regardless, thank you so much for watching. This has been Bill Bronze and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Ron Bafflestone. See you next time.